So <coughs> I'm going to be talking about getting product strategy right, uh, or at least that's what I will be talking about when it appears on screen. Where are my slides? Aha, here we go. So <coughs> the reason I talk about this topic a lot is because actually I think it's way more important than uh, in the early days than, say, getting marketing right or getting sales right. All, you have to get everything right. It's a really hard game that we're in. But, uh, but product strategy is kind of at the very, very start. It's probably the thing you have the most immediate control over. But it's also probably the thing that if and when you get it wrong, it will kill you. And I say that because there's loads of simple figures about this. Uh, Fortune 500, we, we all are probably f familiar with some version of this, which is that these companies do not stick around for a long time. If we take these 500 companies here and we sort of ask ourselves how many of them stick around for a period longer than a longer than, say, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, the answer is not very many, unfortunately. In fact, very, very few. So uh, here is how quickly you fall out of grace from being one of the biggest companies in the world. This, when it started in 55, right up to 2015, this is how quickly it all goes wrong for you, right? I say that only to say that the chances of you dying are pretty high, uh, which isn't the most happiest thought on a Tuesday morning, but it is unfortunately true. Uh, we're probably more familiar with seeing this. The startup version of this looks a little bit more uh, like the sort of the famous grid of logos, all of which have this sort of X that appears over them. So for example, here is a bunch of companies that incorporated the same year as Intercom, and here is how things went for them. Uh, I say all this to say death is a part of life, and product strategy is the one chance we have to kind of recover from this. So, I frequently ask the question internally and of companies that I'm either advising or investing in, like how do we last more than one hype cycle? So everyone is talking about bots today, everyone's talking about AI today, but like 10 years ago, everyone was talking about gamification. 10 years before that, it was the cloud. But the question is, can you actually transcend these sort of temporary trends to actually matter on a sort of longer term? So <clears throat> one, like sort of the specific piece of this is like, how is it that our product strategy can potentially prevent this? And it all comes down to sort of two questions that I suggest you like write down on the walls of your office, and I suggest that you ask them every quarter, every six months, whatever is the right time frame for you. First of all is the idea of like, are we tackling a significant problem for a growing market? And I'll get into the specifics of each of these things in a second. And then, do we attach it to an extendable brand and defend it with a long-lasting moat? So because there's an obvious typo in this slide, I'll skip on. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> there's four elements here I, would, I will talk about. And they are, it's kind of like a jigsaw. There is like a significant problem space. There is an extendable brand. There's a growing market. And there is a defensible moat. And if you get all four of these right, I think you, you can transcend the trends. You can survive for a longer period. So starting with the most obvious, or the one at least where most people, in my opinion, can go wrong, is this idea of a significant problem space, right? I am sick to death of telling people this triangle. Your product must be three things, viable, feasible, and desirable. That is, it must be actually possible, and we've seen a lot of startups lately that get a lot of money for things that aren't actually possible. Uh, it must be feasible, uh, and it must be desirable, right? Now, another way of thinking about this is, can we make money off it? Do people want it, and is it actually possible, okay? Uh, this is like the elementary school version of product strategy. If we I assume that wasn't one of you. <laughs> uh, <coughs> if we can't get these three right, nothing else matters. But <coughs> because people tend to over-index on this triangle quite a lot, I think they generally tend to scope their idea down a little bit, and they end up in a dangerous world. Uh, that dangerous world is where they're solving a, what I would call a small, rare problem. So in general, <coughs> you should not try to solve small and rare problems. Let me explain why. Uh, you can solve big things and small things, and you can solve things that happen every day or things that happen maybe once or twice a year, okay? Uh, and <clears throat> if you manage to find a sweet spot, like let's say Slack, I believe Stuart will be on the stage later, 
Slack solves a big problem, which is collaborating with my colleagues every day. So it's a big, frequent problem. And that's why it doesn't shock us that they're worth billions and billions of dollars. Um, <clears throat> you can solve a big, rare problem, which might be some sort of you know, a very, very uh, holiday booking, for example. Right? It's something you don't do all the time, but it's a big bit of work when you have to do it. Or you can solve a frequent small problem, making it easier to order my morning coffee or something like that, right? That's something, it's not a huge, it's not the biggest problem in my life, but it does happen every day. The worst problems to solve, and sadly too many people go for this, is something like, I've got all these recipes, all these ingredients in my fridge, and I want to be able to make a recipe out of it, so I want an app that takes the, the contents of my fridge and turns it into it. And it's just like, right. It's not actually a big problem, like as in your life will go on. You can actually just work this out. And it doesn't, it's not every day, because you actually don't have that problem every day. Most of the time, you know what you're going to cook, or you have a plan, or you're ordering in, or whatever. In general, try to stay way the hell out of small, rare problems. Other examples of this sort of axes is you can either charge a lot of money or a small amount of money. And you can either talk to your customers a lot, or you can talk to your customers rarely. It is really dangerous to charge not a lot of money for a very involved sales process. If you're charging $9 a month and you have to talk to a customer to, to get them signed up, your business is, based, I think the technical term is fucked, but like, uh, it's, uh, it's not going to work. You're not going to be able to recoup that money. So it is worth thinking about how much work do you have to do to get a customer in the door, and then can we profit off that? Uh, the last way to think about this is this idea of like cost benefit from your customer's point of view, right? So you might say, hey, I'm building an app that like lets you, you know the way people have photos on Facebook and photos on Instagram and photos on Snapchat? Well, I'm going to put all those photos together. And you're like, sure. So here's how much that use is, right? It's a certain point of benefit, right? It's like all my photos are now in one place. Yippee, right? Now. <clears throat> If we were to sort of say, how much work will a user uh, go through to use your product, we're now looking at the cost. So here is basically the benefit line. And if your cost was there, that is kind of like, if you like, that's the most work you can be for your customer. If you're more than that, what you're basically saying is, the solution is a lot worse than the problem, which is what I call like a Brexit app, basically, right? Uh, but like, actually, the solution has made, is actually it's easier to deal with the problem than it is to try and go down this route. If the amount of work you're asking for is just about the same, then it's the solution is as much hassle as the problem is. And yes, I could use your product, but using your product is just as much hassle as actually just keeping my photos in separate places and remembering. right? And, uh, and for what it's worth, I think Google Plus went down this route when they were like, you can organize your friends into circles, and that way you can share things with specific groups. But actually, maintaining your social circles through a web app is just a pain in the ass, so people don't do it. The solution turned out to be just as bad as the problem. But round about here is where we say, you know what? That thing's actually it's not a lot of work. I might give it a shot. And it's really important to think about this from your user's point of view. I think a lot of companies obsess over thinking about these things from their own point of view, and how much will it cost us to build, not how much of a pain in the ass is it for our customers. And as a result, when you all think about the cost, don't think about how much money you're charging. That is the smallest element of the cost, and it's not actually the relevant piece. So the way we tend to think about cost is, well, you know, it's only 99 cents, so whatever. But actually, it's not 99 cents. It's at least 99 cents plus the time to install, configure, create an account. But the way most people think about it is actually, it's like 99 cents, but oh my god, I have to install yet another fucking app to my phone, and they're going to start emailing me, and then it's going to get hacked, and all, all that shit. That's actually the cost of, of you using an app. Uh, so, I would also encourage you to ask yourself, when you're tackling these, these big, substantial problems that happen all the time, ask yourself, do you frequently experience and understand the problem? So if you do frequently experience and understand something, you have the ability to use what's called an OODA loop, which is you can learn new things, make decisions, and act on them very quickly. So if it's your problem, you can do things like this. You can say, does this solve my problem? No, I'll fix it. If it's not your problem, if you're solving it for something that you have known nothing about, you have to go through another loop, which is your research loop. Send it out to the focus group, run a shitload of usability tests, bring it all the way back. So I think that's another important thing to think about here is just like how familiar are you with this problem? And 
Lastly, can you express this problem in a timeless and technology agnostic way? And this is really, if you actually want to last more than like three or four years, this is really important. One of my friends had a startup that let, let, let you do this, literally. Swap phone numbers over Bluetooth with people uh, nearby. And the problem is that phones aren't a thing, phone numbers aren't a thing, and Bluetooth probably won't be a thing. Uh, and that means that in a, not, in a not long time frame, his startup will no longer be relevant. Similarly, I see people who like, try to copy bits of intercom, and what they say is, we're going to send emails automatically when choosers triggers events in your web app. And again, the technology is just one sort of timestamp of this problem. So when all of this new shit comes along, you have to think, oh, well, how does that work with, with Alexa? How does that work with a watch? How does that work with, uh, you know, with say, uh, voice-based computing and all that sort of stuff? You, if you really want to be timeless, you have to not be held ransom to whatever is popular today. Uh, so that, that's the main points about like, the sort of problem you tackle. Another piece I talk about is just uh, growing your market. So it's really important that you pick a market that itself is growing. And the way I always say to this is like, hey, in five years' time, will more people have this problem or less? Uh, will the problem matter more or less? Will it hurt more or less? Right? If, you can't, if the answer is less for any of those, your market is shrinking. The value of your company before you've even started is shrinking. So I, you know, and the, the reason I, I think about this a lot is because we have to think about this from an intercom point of view, which is like, Intercom's all about connecting internet businesses with customers to fuel loyalty through the medium of messaging. So our belief on the future is there will be more internet businesses, customer loyalty will matter more, there'll be more proliferation of tools, and messaging will replace email. We believe that we're betting on a growing market. But you can look at any set of markets and sort of say, you know, will there be more dentists or less in the future? Uh, will second-hand cars be a thing in five years? You know, these are all sort of time-stamped questions that you have to think about if you really want to last for a long enough time. Uh, you might well look at the market and say, oh, there's a gap. No one's doing you know, mobile first this or whatever. To which I'd always say, there might be a gap in the market, but is there a, ga is there a market within that gap? And that's just as important a question. So why, why do we have to obsess over growing markets? Why is it not enough to just you know, work for an existing market that isn't changing? Well, Growing means that you get lots of new entrants, and new entrants are the people most likely to buy your product, which is really, really valuable because you need to effing sell your product. So uh, if you're selling to new companies, the people who just start up, folks like yourselves, new companies will adapt to your tool. Old companies will need your tool to adapt to it. New companies have a burning need because you're, you're their first solution. Old companies are trying to optimize an existing solution. New companies will take a bet on you. Old companies want to see case studies from people just like them. And new companies uh, will buy quickly with no messing around, and old companies have a quarter-long procurement cycle. You can't grow in that latter category. It's just too hard. So it's really, really important that there are enough new entrants to sell to. Brand is probably, for me, the next section. Brand, probably for me, is the most overlooked element when we're creating software companies. I think no one gives it near enough time. Your brand represents the promises that you're making to your customers. But when you start out, your product, your company, your brand, you, the problem you're solving, they're all the same thing, right? Intercom is a company. Intercom is a product. Intercom is a blog. Intercom is a set of people. It's all the same. Um, but the product decisions you make actually, in this early days, actually drive your brand. So, are you saying you're connected? Are you saying you're developer-friendly? Are you social? Are you fast? Are you simple? Are you powerful? These are uh, decisions you make in product that actually drive your brand. But then later on, your brand that you created accidentally drives your product, right? So when I say to you Google Maps, you have the word Google there means things to you. And when I say to you Apple Maps, you think, I bet you they're good looking, but they probably won't get me where I need to go, right? And like, that is genuinely the, the, the challenge. Like when you say Facebook Messenger, you think social, connected, everyone, ads, marketplace, whatever. Uh, if I say to you like Apple Messenger, you think, what is that? Because Apple don't necessarily have a social brand. Um, so that's one whole piece of a brand is knowing that every product decision you make is also a brand decision in the early days. A second piece is like, can your brand extend to match your ambition? So you could call your company Team Chat or you could call it Slack. You could call it developer payments, or you could call it Stripe. 
The difference between calling it Stripe and calling it developer payments is that Stripe have a product called Atlas that lets you incorporate new companies. It does not make sense for developer uh, payments to incorporate new companies. Uh, you could have an event called the Dublin Web Summit, but then what when you want to expand beyond Dublin, right? Uh, and indeed, what when you want to expand beyond the web? These challenges will come up. So it's worth thinking about your brand as, as the future implications it represents. So in terms of like how your brand extends, you can basically have one brand like Google, you know, Microsoft, Facebook, Apple, Stripe, or whatever, that, and then you can have loads of different products that sit under it. Or you can basically have loads of different products all attacking the exact same problem. The, the thing at the top here looks like, say, Sony Walkman back in the days. They had loads of different types of Walkman. Apple's iPad is, iPad is the brand there, but you have iPad Pro, iPad Mini, iPad Regular, iPad whatever. They have like one brand tackling all of these different versions of a job. So it's worth thinking about in the future, like in the next three to five years, what else are you going to do? And can it all comfortably fit under your product idea? And lastly on this is just before you name and characterize your product, so before you give it a name, make sure you're being distinct. Like, are you saying things no one else will? Clear. Does everyone know what you're saying? Resonant. Will they remember what you say, or does it sound like everyone else's shit? Relevant. You can grow a beautiful brand that has literally nothing to do with the software you sell, and that actually happens surprisingly often. And lastly, permanent. Will any of this stick around? So I really do genuinely urge you to think more about your brand. It is, for me, one of the most overlooked elements. When people go hell, like really deep on product strategy, it's often the first thing that they forget to sort of come back and fix. And lastly, to, to last, you need to be able to defend yourself. And you are going to basically be attacked every way possible. Almost every feature you work on either fails or gets copied. That's the reality of our industry, right? We all love to pretend we're brilliant artists who are so significant and so unique, but we all ultimately, when something becomes standard, we copy it. The way that typically looks is something like this. You basically have things that make customers happy and things that piss customers off. And you have things that don't take a lot of work and things that take a shitload of work. So inevitably, when you build a new feature, you put a small amount of work in, and it makes everyone happy because you're the only people with it. It's a del delightful experience. People like it, et cetera. Um, but people start to copy it, which means now users start to require it or expect it, right? Uh, and it means you have to now invest at least as much as everyone else in the industry. And then over time, it'll become what's called a sort of table stakes, right? In that no one will thank you for it, but you have to spend a lot of money to do it properly. So for example, no one gets off an airplane and says, thank God that that thing landed on time. Or sorry, la landed safely, right? No one's like, dear British Airways, you kept me alive. Well done. You know, that's not, it's, it's the least they could do, right? Uh, so it's worth thinking about your features over time go from being delightful to being must have, which is why every competitor will copy them. So then that leads you asking, what is unique? What cannot be copied? The old mode, and that whole piece, by the way, if you're interested, it's called the Kano model, K-A-N-O. Um, which means, what type of moats do you have? Well, you can have economies of scale. That is, you're bigger than everyone else, so you can afford a smaller profit margin, the Amazon route. Uh, network effects. Your product is better because everyone uses it. Something like Facebook has this. Uh, you can have IP patents, trade secrets, et cetera, right? A lot, of what, a lot of what makes the iPhone X so unique is that. You can have high switching costs. This is getting harder to do, but you can make it really hard for somebody to quit, technically. You can lock them in. Or you can have customer loyalty, make it so that no one ever wants to leave. But there are three pieces I'll leave you with in terms of how do you defend yourself in this new world. One is, if you can build a platform that other people rely on, then it's so hard. No one can quit platforms. It's near impossible, right? Salesforce have done this incredibly well. You can't stop yourself from using Salesforce, no matter what, right? Uh, if, you can, if you have the opportunity to turn your product into a platform that others build on, take it. It is valuable. Secondly, build a community of your users, much like the community here in front of me. Uh, 
one, it's hard to copy and paste people. It's easy to copy and paste CSS. So we've been doing a lot of this. This is a photo from our most recent world tour we did. All we're doing here is trying to unite people uh, in Intercom. That's literally all we're trying to do. And lastly, try to build a product, uh, sorry, a product brand that stands alone. So look for the most unique thing you can bake into your product and evolve, like, sort of base your entire sort of company brand around it, right? And if you can do that successfully, there will be no substitutes. People don't actually, you know, there is a whole horde of people who will buy the iPhone X simply because it is called the iPhone X. That is how it works. That is the value of a brand. So my closing sort of point to you is that like, you can get product strategy right, but it has to start from the inside out, right? You start with your problem. Pick a big, big problem that occurs frequently. You then design a solution that is time, that doesn't care about technology, right? Don't care about technology. You then have uh, build a brand that is focused on that exact problem you're solving. And then lastly, take that to a big growing market that will, where your brand will resonate and they will adopt your product like wildfire. I hope some of this has been useful. I'm Des Trainer. Thank you very much.